I've had the iPhone 14 Pro for two weeks now and I wanted to share how it's going so far. Maybe unlike some of the bigger tech channels, this is genuinely my phone that I'm going to be using every day for the rest of the year. So I haven't put it through loads of spec tests and tried to really rinse all of the performance out of it. I want to share my experience as somebody who actually uses the phone for just daily tasks, a little bit of content creation here and there. But for the average user, how's this phone going to perform? We're going to talk about Dynamic Island, the always on display, and of course the camera. But for now, I want to talk about the general experience of upgrading to this phone from the iPhone 13 Pro. Now, before I sent my 13 Pro back to Apple, I had it lying on the desk next to my iPhone 14 Pro most of the time. And the design is so similar that I actually picked it up by mistake quite a few times. This is a UK model, so it still very much has that SIM card tray. And so the only real difference between the iPhone 14 Pro and the iPhone 13 Pro is the size of the camera bump. You can see that it's a little bit bigger on the iPhone 14 Pro with that new 48 megapixel sensor. I personally feel a lot better about this dark purple color than I did about the Sierra Blue, which I mean, I'm from Liverpool, always just reminded me of Man City whenever I picked up my phone. And switching to the purple, it fits with a lot of the other accessories that I've got around the house, so I really like it. I wasn't quite expecting it to be as dark as it is. You really have to sort of shine it in the right light to see that it's even a shade of purple because it could be easily mistaken for a really dark charcoal or grey colour. I think there is a reason for that, and that's because with the iPhone 14 Pro, you've now got access to this always on display. I know it's been around for years with Android, but this is my first experience of it and I'm enjoying it so far, but it has taken a little bit of getting used to. That's because even when you dim the screen right down, it can still be pretty bright. Just a glance of your phone with this always on display actually could trick you into thinking it's been unlocked. So if you do choose a darker background, it's not going to be as distracting. And that's why I do think they've gone for sort of darker models with most of the colors. So one thing that I am really enjoying about the always on display is access to the widgets on the new home screen. I've got a battery widget that tells me how much I've got left on my Apple Watch or my AirPods at a glance, super helpful. I've also got a shortcut into the weather app and uh, access to my rings that shows me how my progress is going with my exercise goals. But we all know what is the hero of this display and it is that dynamic island. I was super intrigued by this. I wanted to know whether I'd actually use it or not. The times that you notice it the most are when you're unlocking your phone, where you can see the face ID animation play out, as well as if you're listening to something on Spotify or Apple Music, it's really nice to have the icon of the album art so you can just glance at what you're listening to or tap into the app to maybe add that song to a playlist. That's probably the most frequent use case of mine so far. And it is really cool to be able to press and hold the widget to pull down things like a stopwatch. There was quite a bit of debate about whether tapping to open up the app and long pressing to open the widget was the right UX decision. And I actually think it was because it's how I'm used to interacting with widgets on my iPhone. I'm somebody who uses the control center, so swiping down from the top right hand side quite often to do things like enter into the Bluetooth menu and connect my Sony headphones uh, when I'm getting on the train. And so actually that behavior is quite normal for me on an iPhone. I understand that if I long press on a widget, I open a pop-up and if I click on something, I just go straight into the app. So yeah, I am enjoying it so far. It's definitely not game changing. It's not worth upgrading from an iPhone 13 Pro 4. And while we are making that comparison, I just wanted to point out that the Dynamic Island doesn't actually fall any deeper than the notch used to. So you're not missing out on any real estate of your screen by using it. But it is more distracting and that's because of the, the pixels that kind of surround it just catch your attention a little bit more. So if you watch a lot of YouTube shorts or you go on TikTok often, you'll notice this because when your phone is in that kind of full screen mode watching your video, you'll have this little black island at the top of the screen where you probably didn't used to notice it before and there are just some kind of wasted pixels up there. <laughs> also good to know, I went and got a screen protector at the Apple store and previously on the iPhone 13 Pro, um, they, they used to have like a little cutout around the notch, I guess, so it wouldn't interfere with the sensor there. 
but on the new iPhone 14 Pro, there's actually no cutout for the dynamic island. So you do actually get a little bit more protection if you get one of those Belkin screen protectors to the full length of your iPhone. And I actually appreciated that as someone who is pretty clumsy. <laughs> Okay, so the cameras. The cameras are really interesting. Obviously, we've got that 48 megapixel sensor. Most of the time, we're not going to be shooting in that raw mode to make full use of that 48 megapixels. But I have been taking some shots to try and compare the level of detail that you get. Personally, I feel like you have to be viewing these photos on a computer or in something like Lightroom to really see the difference, unless you want to really pinch in and kind of zoom into the details. One thing I've enjoyed playing around with is that 2x zoom that the 48 megapixel enables, and especially in video, it can get you some nice K-pop zooms into the, <laughs> into the subject. I think I'm gonna try and experiment a little bit with that, probably more on kind of YouTube shorts than on long form, but I've definitely enjoyed playing around with the camera. One thing I was a little bit more disappointed with was cinematic mode because now we can actually shoot in 4k at 24 frames per second so i was excited to try that out and hopefully try and incorporate it into some videos but if you can see on my shot of dialga here on such a dynamic subject if you will with a lot of different pieces poking out here and there it really doesn't know what to isolate in terms of focusing on the, on the subject and so there's a lot of fringing going on. I think it's probably better if you are aiming your camera at people and trying to switch between subjects in human form, but depending on the subject, it's really not gonna work that well. And I was hoping that they'd put more attention into the AI. I'd say if you're upgrading from an iPhone 13 or anything older or lesser, in inverted commas, you're gonna get an amazing camera out of it. It's gonna be really fun to play around with those new display settings and it's just a beautiful phone, really. From the iPhone 13 Pro up to the iPhone 14 Pro, I'm not really sure it was worth the upgrade. I think because you do get such a big credit back from Apple, like in the UK, I got 550 pounds for trading in my iPhone 13 Pro. That makes it actually pretty decent, but I don't think it's substantially different to actually upgrade from the 13 Pro to the 14 Pro. I'd actually say if you want to upgrade your iPhone, then there are plenty of accessories that can do that for you. So check out this video to see some of my favorites and I'll see you in a bit.